Okay, so um, first I'm happy to be here and to tell you a little bit about what we do in our group and what I'm going to try to do is give you a flavor of what one can do with a large magnet and a few very ambitious students and what we can learn from uh, NMR in general and in my case in a solid phase NMR. So, um, first of all, I'll give a very small overview of what we do in the group and which one is doing what because we always have to thank the people that work. So we're interested basically in protein NMR but in the large sense of protein NMR. So we have a student that is working on developing uh, methods and trying to bring the knowledge of how to actually solve three-dimensional structures by solid state NMR, but that links us to several fields that we work on. And uh, one is that we're looking at bacteriophage viruses, and, there, um, and I'll talk about them a little bit. And not only the problem of how do you solve a structure of very large complex biomolecule with many, many oligomers, but also in the sense that you can make devices out of these viruses, uh, you can use them for phage display, and you want to look at structures which are displayed on, on these peptides. Once you build the basis uh, knowledge of how they look like in the NMR spectrum, you can derive the structure of the drugs which are bound on these viruses. Um, we develop methods how to make our spectrum more uh, simple by different types of isotopic enrichment, and we would like to look at enzymes, and particularly enzymes which are related to, bi to bipolar disorder, patients where lithium is the principal therapeutic uh, uh, drug. And to do that, we have to develop methods to do lithium NMR, and we have both Uzi and Yevgeny developing uh, lithium NMR in particular and NMR of metals in general, and how to look at structure. And these are linked together, again, through these uh, bio-nano devices which are built um, on these bacteriophages. So this is more or less what I'm going to do, and I'm going to talk about uh, briefly on three of these topics. So for the people in the audience that NMR uh, was a very um, old course in their undergrad stu uh, studies, I'm going to briefly uh, discuss what is NMR, and more particularly what is solid state magic and spin NMR, and then go over some of these results. So first of all, what we all learn is that if there is no magnetic field, then the nuclear spins have no particular orientation and there is no net uh, magnetic moment um, in your sample. And once you activate your B0 field, then the spins can align with the magnetic field or against the magnetic fields, and you can have a total magnetization vector pointing to the direction of the magnetic field. Um, this is a beautiful observation um, if you want to look at the spin half system and if you do want to do very, very simple things, or you want to teach an undergrad course. But if you want to do something more, then you have to look at the quantum mechanical uh, picture where the splitting of two energy levels due to the Zeeman field, and the energy difference corresponds to this Larmor frequency. The Larmor frequency depends on the gyromagnetic ratio, and that differentiates between different nuclei. And if you want to look at the quantum mechanical uh, picture, you have to look at the Zeeman Hamiltonian, which is down here. Now, I, I was always asked in NMR, but what do you observe in NMR? Because it seems we don't observe absorption or, or spectra like we use in other spectroscopies. So what we do, uh, what we do classically, and I call this the, also the mathematical picture, uh, which is correct if you uh, project your density matrix to this particular frame of, of three states, then you tilt the this magnetization vector to the Y plane and you oscillate and you look at these oscillations and the tool to do this is the Bloch equations. But this is beautiful for a spin half or for a case where you only look at three different components of the magnetic field. And if you want to solve equations that involve more than a single spin, then uh, one, okay, then one has to look at the quantum picture and then we say that for a spin half, we generate mixed alpha and beta states. And what we do, um, and if you have higher spins, then you have combinations of, uh, of all the energy levels. And one da what one does is take the density matrix approach and look at the projection of the angular momentum on the x direction. So this is the observable in the NMR experiment or oscillations between these mixed states. So this is the signal in the NMR that we look at. 
And this signal is not very large. If you look at the population difference between the two energy levels of a spin half, um, you get this funny number for the 600 machine that we have and for protons. And I'll show you that in solid state we don't look at protons, so it's even lower. But that, what that means is only 50 in every 1 million spins contribute to our signal. So we need many spins, um, or we have to look at low temperature or use high frequencies. Now, high frequencies, then you need a lot of money, of course, and this is limited by technology as well. We have a 600 megahertz machine or 14 Tesla magnet. The state of the art of this type of magnets is one gigahertz magnet. And you want to work at low temperatures, but this is very hard technically. And also, if you look at biological species, it's not always desired to work at 4 Kelvin because we know that these processes are not really active at this type of temperatures. So you're very sample dependent. You have to make a lot of sample or you have to use all sorts of enhancement techniques. Or you have to collect for a long time. So if you have different gyromagnetic ratios, then protons will give you a single line in their alarm frequency and carbons it will also give you a different line and different frequency. So this will be 600 megahertz, this will be 150 megahertz. And if you want to look at a protein, which has 358 carbons, of course, a single line will do nothing for you, and you cannot resolve anything. This is the, a protein that Hadar is working on as a model system for the group. So obviously this is not enough, but we're lucky because the electrons also induce small magnetic fields, and these magnetic fields are sufficient to perturb a little bit the alarm frequency. We call this the chemical shift. And these, are, uh, these shifts are in PPM values with respect to the large magnetic field, but we can separate different species. So these are the different protons in ethanol, and this spectrum was published in 1951, and that's where the chemists stole NMR from the physicist and started using it for their own good. Um, so this is beautiful if you want to drink a coffee and analyze the spectrum. You only see a few lines, but if you look at... This is the spectrum of caffeine. It's a carbon spectrum. So this is really nice. Um, but the problem is that if you look at a protein, then you have so many lines and you cannot resolve anything. And um, so the solution for this is to run two-dimensional experiments. So if two time domains, one is your detection dimension and another one is an indirect dimension where you do something, you let the spin system evolve, then you convert it to detectable uh, magnetization and you observe and so you can see two-dimensional spectra and here you see correlations between nitrogen and protons um, in uh, some sort of a, of a typical folded protein and if you just count the peaks you can know how many amide groups you have in the backbone of your protein you can count how many amino acids you have in your protein uh, of course there is a lot of more a lot more information and you can gener and you can expand this to three-dimensional four-dimensional five-dimensional experiments and your problem, of course, is time, because every dimension multiplies the, the time that you need to spend on the spectrometer by uh, a lot. Yeah, it's completely coherent, because you look at coherent states only. Um, so this was used by Kurt Wuttrich, and, this and, and the, the, the principle that you have interactions between the spins, um, to find protein structure using NMR, and this is the number of structures that have been stored in the PDB, and interestingly, in the recent years, uh, the number of structure of solution NMR is going down. I thought it's a mistake, but I followed this, and I just updated it last night, and it really seems that maybe they're out of structures, I don't know, because so many structures were solved. So by X-ray, 57,000 right for yesterday, 12 o'clock at night, and NMR is 7,632 structures. This is all nice, so you want to solve a protein structure, you can use x-ray, but then you need a crystal, of course, and this is not easy. If there are crystallographers, they know. If you want to do solution NMR, then you need soluble proteins, and they're size limited, and uh, I think some of you know that you have amyloid fibrils, and you have membrane proteins, and you have many, many systems that will not crystallize, and will not dissolve, and are just not suitable for any type of these techniques. Moreover, if you look in general, then if you look at all these systems, they're non-crystallines, they're amorphous, they're not ordered, 
And what kind of structural method do you have to look at local interactions in these type of systems? So these biological macromolecules are just one of example of this large variety of systems that you want to look at. And this is where solid state NMR comes into play. Now, with, if you do this, you have a very big problem because the interaction depends on the angle between the molecule and the magnetic field. So if you're, um, in, um, if you're aligned with the magnetic field, then you have a signal here. But if you're perpendicular, then your signal is here. And if you have all orientations in the powder because you don't have a crystal, then you have this very, very broad powder-like line shape. So uh, what do you do? You try to mimic motion in a solution. So you start spinning the sample in this uh, angle, which we call theta r, the magic angle or the rotation angle. And then you have an interaction tensor because your inter interactions are anisotropic now. They have a certain axis with respect to your spinning axis, and the spinning axis is a different angle with respect to the magnetic field. All this mathematics gives you expressions that look like a product of these two angles plus some function which is time dependent. If you spin fast enough, then you get rid of this term, um, or as you see spinning sidebands until they completely vanish. And if you put theta r to be 54.7, then this time independent term vanishes and you end up with a very, very uh, narrow line. So you manage to reach high resolution spectrum despite the fact that you have anisotropic interactions and we're going to use these and interfere with its averaging to get the interaction that we want to look at. So if you do this, you can do multidimensional magic angle spinning NMR and also get very high resolution spectra. You can take 3D spectra that cannot be resolved and start looking at different planes where you can resolve peaks and you can use the methods uh, for many applications. Um, now, if you want to solve a structure, this is not enough. You need two things. You need structure constraints. So uh, you have to measure distances. You can do this with a dipolar interaction. This is, again, an anisotropic interaction. It will average to zero in solution, but not in the solid phase. But when you spin the sample over a single rotor period, it will average to zero, but we'll see that we can recouple this interaction Another method is to relate chemical shift to secondary structure, and this is very, very, very well established. So if you look at the alpha helix or a beta sheet, then the chemical shift you observe are different. So this is another way to look at, at structure. It's not as accurate as the distances, but it gives you a very fast overview of the secondary, secondary structure of your protein. So um, how do you measure distances? We took this compound, this phenylphosphino benzoic acid, and we want to measure the accurate distance between uh, this carbonyl and the phosphorus. And this is in a powder. It's not a crystal. It's not anything. Um, if you look at this function, then it oscill the oscillations give you zero overall. This is the dipolar interaction. It's, a, it's a, a sum of cosine terms. I just took one of these sine terms. But if you start giving pulses, then you interfere with the averaging of this function. And you can do it selectively and only leave the term that has this dipolar interaction in this. This is called the Redor experiment. It was developed in 1989. Basically, what you do is you measure this spectrum. This is your C13 spectrum. You measure this spectrum, and this spectrum dephases due to this dipolar interaction, not due to any other interaction. And then you take the difference, and what you get is the following you get the black spectrum, which is your reference, the red spectrum, which is your dephase spectrum, this one, and then the difference has peak intensities in any, dif in any of the lines. So if we look at the intensity of the carbony line as the function of time, then these are these experimental points. And then you can solve analytically this uh, experiment. This is uh, not my computer, so. <laughs> um, but he's online, I think he's here, right? Um, you're online, Roy. But anyway, what, what the nice thing about this is now we can see the result, which pops up like uh, an animated figure. And what you can see, what I want to show in this figure is the sensitivity of the method. So we, sim we calculated lines between 3 angstrom and 3.5 angstrom. These are the red line and the blue line. And you see the experimental results. So you have an extremely sensitive and accurate method to measure internuclear distances. 
between two spin halves, phosphorus and carbon. And, um, and, and you can see the comparison between the calculated and experimental data. But this is all known, so what do, uh, what, why am I showing you this? Because if you want to look at aluminum, aluminum has a spin five half, it's a much more complex system. And if you run a regular experiment that there is hardly any dephase signal, and then, lucky for me, I had a very talented student, and he did some simulations. And then he found out, he came up with an experiment that we call the low alpha redor, and this is because of some adiabaticity constant, which we call alpha, uh, that was violated in our experiment, yet we get much better defacing of the signal. And we were very happy, of course, because if you um, do this experiment and look at different points, then... Uh, this is the regular experiment. You get dephasing, or in this, you have to reverse the picture to see the dephasing. But this is only due to the dipolar interaction. This is the analytical formula if your, if your experiment was ideal, and of course it's not. But now with our method, we can get this line here, which is much, much better. And we now have hope to look at very low gamma nuclei and, and all kinds of different experiments. There are cases where this um, curve will just rise this way, and still our experiment will go very, very high. But uh, being a physicist, uh, then my student said, well, this is not enough because I don't ex I ex understand the analytical formula for this. And I told him, well, this is really, really complicated, but why don't you go ahead and try? So these are the pulses that we apply, and you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian in non-commuting terms. So you have to use what uh, is called the average Hamiltonian theory and find the IX, or the observation operator for this, uh, for this Hamiltonian, and we, he came up with these equations. We are not going to look at them. I'm just, I was so impressed by the fact that we achieved this that I just I had to put it here. So we solved it to two spin halves, and spin half, spin three half. The only thing I want to look at is, is a cosine term. Everybody knows how to read a cosine. So if we have a cosine of four pi times this is the RF irradiation uh, strength, and this is the spinning frequency. And what we see here is that we have a new resonance condition in our field. We like resonance conditions between the irradiation and the spinning of the sample. And this condition is the, means that the RF has to be one-fourth of the spinning rate. Now, of course, I didn't believe this equation, so I told him you have to do simulation and show me the analytical formula to see if they fit. And these are beautiful fitting of simulating single crystals, putting the simulation, full calculation of the density metrics and the analytical formula. This is in the on-resonance condition, what you call, this is off-resonance, so the oscillations are shallower. And not only that, you can tune, you can work on resonance and you can work off resonance. This is the powder average, and you can use extremely low RF powers, which is very, very important for solid state NMR. So we have now a beautiful method to measure inter-nuclear inter, uh, distances. And there are many applications for using very low RF power because you're band selective. And in some cases, uh, you just cannot use sufficiently high power uh, values. Um, now, the other side of looking at enzymes um, is looking at proteins and looking at very complex systems. So if we looked at two spins before, and now we're going to look at millions of spins and we're going to look at these bacteriophages. So these are just stem images. And this is the M13 phage, FT phase. So these are um, very, very long and narrow if, uh, um, rods of viruses. They have different coiling behavior. I like them because they form beautiful um, biofringes as liquid crystals. And also... Um, perhaps very suitable for this, uh, for, for this uh, conference that we're in. You can make out of these uh, all kinds of uh, biotemplates for lithium-ion batteries, and these are all kinds of characteristics. And if you have metals which are bound because you modify the DNA of these bacteriophages, then you want to look at metal protein distances, just like in enzymes, just like in other systems. Um, so these are all the components in a group, as you can see here. And um, so also they're important for all these type of things. So just keep, keep them. And um, we, we are asking the question of structure, uh, but I just want to see the architecture of the viruses. We have a DNA, and we have around it many, many, many code proteins. 
this is how they look like. This is the capsid protein and the DNA, and we're going to look at the capsid protein because this is about 98% of the mass. And if you look at the literature, at all the structures, then basically they all suggest polymorphism. They all require alignment, and they all require a mutant because otherwise the wild type give very, very broad lines. And so we uh, decided to not to take the mutant but the wild type, and we took the carbon spectrum. You see here, I'll just skip a few of these, and we see single peaks, and we can tell... Um, we can, we can know what the secondary structure is of these uh, proteins. If it's a helical region or the coiler region, this is just the alanines. We can look at particular amino acids in the sequence, and these are very, very unique lines here for the proline and here for the isoleucines, the three types. And uh, we can always also come up with new methods to get, very, uh, good, uh, to get much narrower lines. And the final solution of this very, very uh, detailed analysis of thousands of peaks is to use the chemical shifts to predict torsion angles and to get uh, uh, a model for the secondary structure of the code protein. So this is what comes up of this work. And I think I have two minutes or so, so I'll just do it very, very fast because I mentioned lithium and metals, and I have to show them. So this is our interest in molecular psychiatry, what is called. We look at this enzyme, which has three magnesium binding sites, and what I teach in general chemistry is that lithium and magnesium are very, very similar. We have cross-similarity in the periodic table, and that is because of their ionic radius. And therefore, lithium inhibits uh, the protein by replacing magnesium, but it's not known in which site it resides. So one has to make this protein, which is not easy, and identify the lithium and the binding sites and so on. So my student managed to do expression, purification, characterization, binding assays, and all that stuff. And some of the characterizations are shown here. This is a beautiful gel. And the fact that it's active and inhibited by lithium. But then you run the experiment, and all you see is free lithium signal. And this is very, very disappointing after so much hard work. But then if th you think about it, the bound lithium will, ha will have a more static environment. This is where you use, we use the, the fact that this is a solid system. So if you use the protons to transfer polarization to the lithium, then you can differentiate a new site that comes up here, and this is probably the lithium in the binding site. This is not enough to do spectroscopy on this little peak here, so you have to play some more tricks. And I won't elaborate on to what type of tricks we do, but you can separate the bound lithium and reduce the, the free lithium uh, in solution. And now you can do spectroscopy in this. This is the next step. The only thing we also wanted to try is the apple protein here. And um, what we see now is that the binding site is on the right side. And these are just uh, other uh, different species of lithium which are bound to the other magnesium sites because they're not occupied by magnesium. So this is an uncompetitive binding, and this is, uh, this is an, uh, okay, this is the inhibition site, and these are other sites because there is no magnesium, and this is the reverse picture of what we saw here. So uh, this is exactly on time, I think, and uh, I'll just conclude and show that it's an, a magic angle spinning NMR is a very, very good system. If you have a complex system, non-soluble, non-crystalline, but you still want to know a lot of information about this. And I'll just throw a different example for materials where you have a zeolite <coughs> with aluminum defect sites. And you want to say, ask what, time, what type of defect sites you have, what type of coordination do you have for the alumina, um, does it have protons bound to it or hydroxyl groups or whatever, and this, this aluminum can be 1% of a structure, for example, but all the important chemistry sits there. Yeah, the other thing is that we show that we can look at very accurately at distances between any two spins that you can think that have an NMR um, active nuclei, and we've done some theoretical and experimental development in this field uh, to characterize also complex materials if you have a very, very particular problem. And then we use these methods to look at lithium ions in a very, very large enzyme. So it's a 55 kilodalton enzyme, and you look at a single spin in the active site. And what we hope to do is correlate the lithium to the spins around it using these methods that we developed here. 
And finally, we can look at extremely large oligomers. There are thir about 20 megadaltons in molecular weight. And we can still up, uh, come up with a lot of important information about the structure, conformation, and hopefully in the future about phage display systems and all kind of um, material related templates of these bacteriophages. So with uh, this I end, and this is funding and, and strains, sources, and this is my group. So thank you. What is the percentage of carbon-13 in nature? The reason I'm asking is because uh, there are, in nature, you find mostly C14, and for applications like oil exploration, you don't want to have to, to look for C13 if it's in too small quantity. That's correct. So uh, the natural abundance of carbon-13 is 1%. Oh, that's not so low. It's not so low. So if you want to just look at carbon at natural, uh, what I showed, for example, on this uh, diphenyl benzoic acid is natural abundance. Because you look at coupling of the carbon, which is 1%, with phosphorus, which is 100%. If you want to look at carbon-carbon interactions in a natural abundance system, of course, you have a 0.01% of having a carbon-carbon pair. And then you have to enrich with uh, C13. This is what we do in proteins. We grow them in, uh, in an enriched environment. Actually, for oil exploration, what you want to see is whether you have H2O or, or oil. So you, you want to look for, for CH, you, for yeah. CH That's true, but, you, but we, what you do for oil exploration, and this is, of course, being done in, with the, using NMR, is to look at the proton signal. And proton is 100% natural abundance. And the relaxation properties of water and oil are completely different. So uh, this is, I, I think this is what's being used in oil drilling um, experiments. Uh, w w when, when you sm slow down the rotation, the peaks start to smear, I guess. Like you, you, you have this magic angle uh, spinning. When you slow it down, it okay. will start you, to smear. No, when you slow down, okay, it depends on the interactions that you have. Assuming we have only a weak heteronuclear dipolar interaction, for example, le, le, then slowing le, le, the spinning will generate only more spinning sidebands until they merge. It depends on your resolution. If you spin even 500 hertz, you get narrow peaks, but you have many, many, many of them. And if you do a different uh, spinning rate, then the line width of the peaks doesn't change much, but the number of peaks changes. So it's my, the my, Fourier my question, transform property of time. My question dependence. is whether they all do it the same, whether you can gain some information by slowing the spinning down and see the, uh, different peaks spread or expand in different ways. There are experiments. Okay, if you want to uh, extract the anisotropic information, then there are two ways to do it. One is to spin slowly, and then you can simulate the sideband pattern because their intensities depend on the spinning rate. So if you simulate the intensities of all these spinning sidebands, well, you can extract the anisotropic information that you want, the chemical shift or the dipolar interaction or the quadrupolar interaction, and so on. Um, if you spin very fast, then you eliminate all this information, but you can recouple it with pulses, as I showed. Now, there are cases where spinning will not be sufficient, just because if you have a homonuclear, a homonuclear spin pair, for example, you have a flip-flop term, and that Hamiltonian is not self-commuting, so you have broadening even if you spin very, very fast. Then you have to play other tricks. You have to average in spin space, for example, by using complicated... Uh, pulsing schemes. So there are cases where spinning is not sufficient. For example, if your quadrupolar interaction is very large, then the second order term becomes important. And this uh, looks like a P4, uh, the, the fourth order Legendre polynomial. So the 54.7 angle is not enough. You have to spin on a different axis. So there are actually spinning rotors that spin in 54 degrees in another rotor in another spinning axis that spin the 74 degrees, and you do, this is called double rotation, and you spin it on both axes. So this is also an option. <laughs>